Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's IFAM webinar. Uh, I'd like to begin some introductions while the room is filling up. Uh, I'm Ron Ackerman, I direct IFAM, and I'm Senior Associate Dean for Public Health here at Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm very delighted today to welcome you to our presentation, which is co-sponsored by our program in public health in commemoration of the program's 25th anniversary in the coming year. Today's presentation is titled, Integrating Clinical Decision Support into Everyday Care. And it's given by Ethan Molich Howe, who is a graduate of the program in public health in 2008, and now is Assistant Professor of Medicine in the section of hospital medicine at University of Chicago. As a reminder, during all of our webinars, we encourage the audience to pose questions of our presenter. If you have any questions during, at any point during the presentation, simply type them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please don't use the chat function as we won't be monitoring it routinely for your questions. Ethan Molich Ho is an academic hospitalist who is board certified in internal medicine. As I said, he's a graduate of our program in public health as well as the Northwestern School of Medicine. Dr. Molich Ho is interested in how electronic medical records and health information technology can impact direct patient care, patient physician interaction, and quality improvement in hospital care. He's currently U of C's section of hospital medicine's lead hospitalist for the care of patients with COVID-19 which includes responsibilities in areas of administration, operations and clinical care, health information technology, education, quality improvement, and research. With this introduction, I now would like to turn it over, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Molich Ho. Dr. Molich Ho. Thank you so much for the uh, kind introduction and afternoon to everyone uh, in the audience here. I'm excited to be uh, virtually back at Northwestern, uh, if not in person, at least uh, virtually kind of uh, uh, coming back to uh, my roots in medicine here. And so um, I'm excited to be here and, and talking with you all. And so just a little bit of the um, overview of what I'll be talking about. First, I'll kind of start just with some of our basic challenges in clinical decision making, um, then provide uh, an introduction to what clinical decision support systems are and, and how they integrate and then discuss some of the current practical applications that I've been involved with, uh, as well as some of my colleagues and some of the ongoing uh, efforts here at the University of Chicago uh, in, the, in our section of hospital medicine. So I wanna start with a case. Um, so Mr. Ree, I know we've all probably had our Mr. Ree cases uh, in the past, but Mr. Ree, uh, he's a 66 year old gentleman with a history of hypertension, diabetes, and a smoking history who came to the emergency room with a chief complaint and so those of us that are clinically trained and in, medi uh, in medicine, you're probably already starting to think of your differential uh, diagnosis for this patient. What's bringing him in with uh, shortness of breath? Is it a new onset heart failure from his longstanding hypertension? Is it new COPD uh, from his smoking history or a new lung cancer? And given the climate of our times, could this be a new COVID diagnosis? You're already starting to think of the next questions that you're gonna be asking, um, you know, well, what brings on your shortness of breath? Are you having chest pain with it? Are you having any lower extremity swelling? Are you coughing? Are you having fevers? And, you know, are you having any long car rides recently? You're probably already thinking about what tests you're going to be ordering. You know, are you going to be ordering a, a chest x-ray or an EKG uh, or an echocardiogram? All of these things are going through your head just based off of your years of reading about this chief complaint of shortness of breath, and maybe you're reading about uh, hypertension and, and smoking history, and all of that is kind of informing your uh, question asking and, and what, uh, what clinical decisions you're going to be making. And so uh, you've probably also read kind of the most recent literature and are up to date on the guidelines that uh, help drive the patient care. And so when we think about how we go from our diff large differential at the beginning down to our diagnoses, we're taking in that chief complaint, we're asking our medical history, um, we're getting our physical exam and getting diagnostic testing, and our differentials narrowing down to an organ disease, uh, specific disease state, we're getting our diagnostic impression, and then get coming up with our diagnosis. 
But along this process, there's so many challenges that come into place as to when we are making these clinical decisions and coming up with our diagnoses. Medicine involves so much uncertainty. I don't think you'll ever run into an internist that says, I, I am 100% accurate about uh, uh, most things. Usually we provide a lot of caveats every time we're talking about a disease process and, and what might happen and, and what steps we might take. There's so many variables that go into every clinical decision, um, some of which are patient-based that go beyond kind of our human capabilities of uh, processing all the variables. And then due cost and risks of testing, so you can't test for everything. So someone that comes in with shortness of breath, we're not gonna uh, get tests for everything that's on that broad differential that we started off with. Um, we're gonna narrow our differentials based off of the most likely uh, diagnoses and um, try and narrow our differentials towards coming in. We have these biases that uh, influence us when we're thinking about our patients, not just um, the biases of gender and uh, race that often come into play, but biases and, and heuristics that come in as to when we're thinking about, and I'll go through this. We have so many pressures that limit us when we're practicing, and we don't have all the information available to us about what the patient is in front of us. So this is just a schematic about you know, our human cognitive capacity and the sheer number of variables that are out there for um, every decision that we're making. And as uh, medicine has advanced and improved and we're able to test for so many more things, including you know, genetics and proteomics and uh, gene expression that can influence how people respond to medications or their likelihood of disease, all of these factors that we can test for um, just logarithmically expand beyond what our human uh, capacity can really comprehend and goes beyond that, these normal decisions that we're making by these clinical phenotypes. We have these biases in decision-making, and I believe I first learned about these during my MPH training uh, back at Northwestern. And so um, just to go through a few of the, the biases and heuristics that um, help, that, that uh, hurt us in making our decisions um, and maybe testing excessively. So there is the availability bias um, where a recent memory or recent event can make us uh, think about something being more prevalent uh, than it actually is. For example, I recently had a, I went to a case conference about a rare uh, acquired factor eight deficiency a few days ago. And uh, I had to admit a patient a few days after that who had bleeding uh, trouble. And this patient had a wide variety of reasons for bleeding, but because that factor eight deficiency, acquired factor eight deficiency was on my mind, start to think, do I need to get a mixing study on this guy? Do I have to um, look into the acquired factor eight deficiency when it was something that is far more rare than it actually is? We have things like representative bias where um, due to how a patient looks, we might uh, raise up the probability of, uh, of a rare diagnosis because a, a tall man with a heart murmur walk through, I start thinking about Marfan syndrome and mitral valve prolapse before uh, thinking of uh, more common diseases that could be going on with this patient. There's anchoring. So in hospital medicine, I often get sign out from the emergency room or from some of my colleagues. And oftentimes when I get that sign out, you know, they give me a diagnosis um, to, to move forward with. And sometimes that anchors my thinking. For example, I just had a patient with um, Wilson's disease causing hepatic failure. And the patient was encephalopathic, wasn't thinking clearly. But two weeks prior to my meeting him, uh, she was interacting with her family, was um, eating on her own. But when I met her, she was not saying any words coherently and wasn't feeding herself. And it took me a couple of days of kind of getting more of this history and more of the story and talking with family to realize that maybe we were missing something going on. Um, we ended up testing for a catheter associated UTI, uh, urinary tract infection and saw that that was there. So started antibiotics, removed the catheter, and she got back to the point where um, she was interacting with her family and, and feeding herself again. But because of that anchoring component, it did delay me for a couple of days to finding that infection. There's value induced by a certain, something I like to call the WebMD, it's cancer effect. So uh, every time that you Google your headache, uh, one of the things that comes up is the you know, brain tumors on that differential. And so for the person that's seeing this could be cancer, this, this could be something um, that helps raise this rarer possibility um, to the forefront uh, when it really doesn't need to be as high. But it does influence us in medicine. You know, oftentimes we'll be getting uh, unnecessary stress tests or um, uh, PE protocol, 
pulmonary embolism protocol CT scans uh, to rule out uh, these high risk uh, elements. And sometimes those are appropriate, but other times they, they're tests that can be avoided. Um, but because of that value induced bias, sometimes it limits us. And so this is a uh, accurate uh, sketching, I believe, of myself on the wards uh, a couple weeks ago, um, where I had my IV uh, espresso bag going in uh, as I was uh, uh, taking care of patients. But when we are in these kind of high stress environments with lots of patients, admitting multiple patients from the ER, it really does affect you. We have our limited short term memory. We're often late and hurried, uh, admitting one patient, but having three more we have to admit, and to being high stressed and high fatigued. We have this limited ability to multitask. Some of us are better than others, but uh, we definitely have a limited ability. And then as we walk around, we carry around one of these pagers that uh, interrupts us every time we uh, start trying to think or talk and uh, get interrupted for another thought. And so um, having those interruptions definitely affects our train of thought. And so maybe as we're thinking through our differential or thinking through tests that we want to get, those distractions then uh, limit us from carrying forward what our plan of care is going to be. We have incomplete data uh, for the patients that are in front of us. Uh, an old study by uh, the Markle Foundation found that um, in a clinic, 81% of cases were missing data, uh, whether it was a medication that was a patient uh, was on a diagnosis of past surgery that a patient had. Um, they were missing up to an average of four items of critical data uh, about a patient. And 18% of medical errors are due to inadequate availability of patient information. You know, we're lucky in Chicago a bit um, in that a lot of the major institutions uh, here at University of Chicago, at Loyola, at Northwestern, we all use similar um, uh, health records. And so they can communicate and we can see what's happening at the other hospitals. We have all these little um, community hospitals near us where we often get patients from um, these uh, community hospitals and, and we don't know uh, exactly everything that's happened there. Um, and sometimes our reliance on patients or on uh, whatever that facility has uh, sent us about the, the clinical care that was done. So now going back to mystery, uh, I think, think about that first diagnosis that popped into your head about what you thought was going on. And were you being influenced by bias? Were you distracted by something? Maybe you didn't hear me say the whole first sentence. And so you missed kind of uh, uh, something that was going on. And then, then that might have uh, influenced your decision making and things. And so even though this is a case that's relatively straightforward that we see many times a day, the uh, uh, all of these biases and influences can uh, affect how we're uh, processing this clinical care. And so now that we're already kind of having some struggles to come up with a diagnosis, now we have to figure out how to treat that diagnosis. And so we have this, you know, medical knowledge resource hierarchy that's there. You know, we have our original studies that uh, um, so our basic scientists and our clinical researchers produce um, that kind of guide uh, a lot of our clinical care. Those are then combined into larger studies, meta-analyses, and uh, uh, systemic reviews to, that are available in PubMed and then on Cochrane. Those are then synthesized down to, um, I think, probably what's used most commonly on the wards, up-to-date or uh, Dynamed or the guidelines from the um, USPSTF uh, task force um, to uh, guide our clinical care. Um, but that time that it takes to go from uh, those original studies all the way to uh, clinical practice, going from bench to bedside, on average, can take up to 17 years to truly become routine clinical practice. Some of that is the kind of the research and development component of things. Some of that, though, is uh, on clinical practitioners like myself who uh, get locked into things that we're doing and maybe we don't adjust uh, care despite guidelines and despite uh, the most recent evidence. Um, until it becomes more routine practice. And so, you know, guidelines are kind of what uh, drive a lot of us and there's, you know, great public health and, and population-based resources that help provide kind of best levels of care for um, common clinical scenarios. Uh, but some of the limitations that come through, so they're not always able to account for the individual that's in front of me. So while I have these population level data um, based off of, um, you know, well-controlled studies, oftentimes older and more complex patients aren't always included in that um, underlying data that's there. We have these, when we're following just a guideline directly, we're not always as able to pursue new etiologies, diagnoses, and treatments, and so they're not always integrated into 
um, a guideline of somebody straying from uh, the path that, that they're on. These guidelines can be incomplete and not frequently updated, um, difficult to integrate into the electronic health record. And there's not always clear evidence for strength. They're actually very good about this, but um, when it gets in front of the provider, we don't always know exactly what the strength level is of what's in front of us and, and whether we need to uh, aggressively follow it. And then we can be in a time like today uh, where we have this active pandemic and new information is coming out at a rapid pace where we're getting information from social media, from uh, the news, from uh, relatives. Um, we're getting uh, press releases about papers before we actually get to see the, the paper themselves. The papers get put up online um, before peer review, uh, and so we can see the paper, but they haven't gone through the uh, rigorous processes. And then at a time like this, when paper after paper after paper just is coming out and bombarding us, uh, it can be overwhelming for the clinician that's on the ground uh, to know what is the latest uh, element to attack COVID and, and, and treat it uh, uh, with all this new information that's out. And that happens not just in an intense environment like um, the pandemic, it happens kind of with every routine um, patient care. So again, going back to Mr. E, um, you know, we've already thought about, you know, some challenges in coming up with our diagnosis, but, you know, how do I know that I'm giving the latest and greatest care for this patient? Is this ACS, do I still need to load them uh, with a Covidacrel or Antigochlor to assure that they're getting good care for their ACS? Um, uh, are the guidelines in Europe and the guidelines in the United States differing on these things? And uh, how do I know which one to follow? And so, Oftentimes, the uh, guidelines and the uh, uh, events of the day can limit us as to how we're approaching and giving that best care. So the hope is that clinical decision support systems, um, so integrating things like up-to-date and this latest evidence into um, patient care every day can, can help us um, navigate some of those barriers that uh, I mentioned towards coming up with diagnosis and treatment. I think a lot of times when people think about clinical decision support, they're thinking about Watson and Dr. Watson coming up with diagnoses and uh, coming up with uh, finding that rare form of leukemia when doctors have misdiagnosed it. But we're not talking about physician replacement systems. We're not talking about computers taking over. We're talking about um, support systems. Uh, so there is always a, a user on the other end of these things. And, and we wanna make sure that these systems are, are they're able to take any user, any physician on those ends and um, be able to uh, guide them towards care. So they don't necessarily end up like uh, uh, Andy Dwyer typing in and, and thinking that there's just network connectivity problems and that's the, the true diagnosis. So just a few definitions about you know, what clinical support systems are. Um, so one definition is an active knowledge system that takes two or more items of patient data to give case-specific advice. Clinical decision support systems are systems that provide information to the clinician in ways that help them make uh, better clinical decisions. Computer systems decide to impact clin clinician decision making about an individual patient uh, at the point of time that these decisions are made. So why do we think these are important? So helping us bridge that gap between translating uh, that science that's done um, from that discovery point and helping disseminate that information uh, to hopefully influence patient care um, and change behavior of the physicians on the ground. We wanna keep the initial promise of the electronic health record where you know, everything that was touted in patient safety and healthcare quality um, played a role. They become a, a key requirement for meaningful use um, defined by uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And then ways to help us um, absorb all that information overload, both on the sheer number of variables that go into a clinical decision, as well as uh, all that uh, overload of um, medical knowledge that's out there. So a few different types of uh, clinical decision support systems. So one of the first branching points we think about are diagnostic versus interventional. So diagnostic, you know, what is true? That's where you're uh, trying to figure out what that diagnosis in front of you versus interventional, that what to do uh, component of uh, which tests to order and what interventions to take. TDSS symptoms can be passive versus active. And 
Um, so passive being the information's there, it's in front of you, uh, but sometimes you have to go out of your way to click on it to read through it, um, or uh, you can take or leave what's there um, uh, to, to see it. Active is uh, probably what most people are familiar with, you know, those alerts that kind of come up saying this, these two drugs interact or um, the uh, element in an order that kind of guides you uh, along the way to um, help you come up with a decision. There's this element of consulting versus critiquing. Um, so if I have a patient in front of me that has a new blood clot and I wanna start them on a, a Pixaban, for instance, uh, you can think about when I'm ordering that a Pixaban, uh, it kind of gives me some questions as to what am I treating? Am I treating atrial fibrillation or am I treating a new blood clot? Um, does the patient have any factors that might uh, influence what dose I want to use? Is, are they elderly? Are they, do they have renal insufficiency? Uh, or do they have a low body weight? Should I use a lower dose of a Pixaban when I'm giving it? And so um, it can be integrated into that order. So it asks those questions um, as you're going through and then guides you on what dose to use for it versus critiquing. So I order my five milligrams twice a day of a Pixaban. And uh, after I click my order, I get an alert back at me saying, uh, no, uh, this patient is 80 years old and has a poor creatinine clearance. Please consider using uh, 2.5 milligrams. Do you want to change your order? Um, or this is a new clot. You should use your higher dosing. And so that's that consulting versus critiquing element. So Knowledge-based clinical decision support systems are you know, the majority of clinical decision support. So they take this underlying medical knowledge that's programmed into the system. So thing if-then rules, if my patient is greater than 80 and has renal insufficiency, a lower dose should be used. It takes in probabilistic associations and signs and symptoms. So um, while I uh, did work, I still remember my days uh, during NPH uh, working with Bing Chang and um, my small group uh, trying to determine whether a D-dimer uh, influenced my pretest probability and if, whether I needed to get a CT scan. But all of that, uh, at that time, I didn't say, let's all program that into a computer as opposed to doing it ourselves. Um, but now that can be programmed into the computer so that uh, uh, you can help limit any error uh, that a physician can make. You can enter things like the known drug, drug uh, and drug allergy or drug food interactions that are there. All this medical knowledge base uh, gets programmed in and then it gets combined with patient data and goes through an inference engine that uses formulas that combine these rules and associations and the knowledge base with the patient that's in front of you. Um, and then it can give you the uh, case specific advice uh, right uh, as you're caring for that patient, um, giving an alert at the time of uh, order entry. So we're hoping that you know the CDSS can uh, be it'll help us improve clinical care. So a person with uh, technology is better than a person without support alone. So these external aids link medical knowledge and patient specific data, bridge the gap between the knowledge and practice and identify different options for the user. Without these tools, providers may make errors, overlook available knowledge and don't always account for the uniqueness of patients. And we still, even with these supports, can still make these errors, but um, we're hoping that the, the role of CDS can, can improve that. So just thinking of some of the early systems that were developed for uh, computer-assisted diagnosis. One of the first ones was called Internist I, or now called QMR. It's an expert system to help with uh, diagnosis of um, patients and narrowing things down to uh, based off of symptoms that are entered and, and data that's entered. It was actually designed to capture the expertise of, of just one man. Uh, no, no, it wasn't Dr. House. It was uh, Jack Myers, the, the chairman of internal medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, um, who uh, his knowledge base was uh, uh, attempted to be captured into a computer program as part of a uh, uh, educational experiment uh, that was going on. This, these actually were studied, some of the diagnoses uh, related um, devices. And, uh, the performance wasn't great back in 1994. You know, our, our average uh, success with these, um, about 50 to 70% of the time, we actually got the diagnosis using these things. So one of the early um, clinical decision support systems at Vanderbilt 
Um, so I apologize. I, I know that the clinicians in the audience probably are already trying to click on the screen here to close this pop-up window, um, but this is one of the first pop-up windows that existed. So for ICU level care in uh, at Vanderbilt, um, they wanted to assure that they had a target for uh, the RAS scores to help monitor sedation of their ICU patients and making sure that they weren't getting too much or too little um, uh, uh, sedation uh, to go along with them. So this is one way that the Vanderbilt system uh, helped trigger you to order um, a target for their RAS score. So if you clicked on this, you then got an order uh, that you could enter to enter your uh, level of RAS uh, that you wanted the patient to get. This is one of the early systems at uh, Brigham Women's um, and Partners in Health um, was a longitudinal medical record that took into all of the uh, ambulatory accounts. It really did focus on medications um, and helping uh, give clinical decision support for them and helping you reduce uh, adverse drug events um, by uh, assessing dosing and assessing um, drug-drug interactions, as I had previously mentioned. They also did give some anticipatory medication decision support. So when we're thinking about our ideal clinical decision support, our goal is to increase adherence to guideline-based care, decrease medication error, provide cost-effective recommendations, improve the ability to process information, and reduce redundant testing. Um, and be population-based, then uh, narrow down to patient specifics for the patients that are in front of us. But as we all know, computers are far from perfect, and those of us that have worked uh, clinically know that you know the what can be produced is only as good as uh, what goes into it. And so, some limitations. So, think about the definitions that get brought into um, uh, that are entered into the medical electronic health record. So how do we define weight in our system? Uh, and which data point are you being pulled? Are you pulling the patient weight, the ideal body weight, the weight that was measured at home in the hospital before hydration, after hydration? Which weight should the computer use to help you make decisions? I'm sure somebody diagnosed someone with uh, hypertension today uh, and documented it. And how was it documented in the electronic health record? Did you write? hypertension, HTN, high blood pressure, high BP? Did you let the blood pressure speak for itself? I'm sure you build, so you had to write an ICD-10 code that tried to capture the information uh, uh, to capture all of that. Maybe you misspelled hypertension in your note, and so maybe it wasn't captured as much. So how well these systems work depends on how they're structured and whether the vocabulary can match the terms that uh, clinicians use. There are temporal considerations that have come to place. You know, time related to symptoms are difficult to express in a controlled vocabulary. So physicians use a lot of different uh, elements to uh, talk about um, time, you know, days prior to admission or um, has been going on for some time. Uh, it can be very nonspecific. And, but these temporal modifiers can be pretty difficult to build into the system and even small changes um, as you think about, you know, kind of goals of when to get someone to the cath lab or to um, get uh, TPA initiation. These small changes in timing can make a big difference into the conclusion that um, a uh, system ends up reaching. So I just want to talk about some ways you can see clinical decision support in the electronic health record. There are things like info buttons that you can click on uh, to give you reference material um, about either a device, a medication, uh, a, a lab value. You think about calculators and calculations that are done, like your um, fractional excretion of sodium or urea um, or other calculators that can be used. Order sets are kind of the lifeblood of the hospital list, and so it's how we uh, admit our patients and enter orders uh, to care for our patients. Then alerts, I think these are the ones that uh, everyone's aware of, but medication alerts that kind of give the drug-drug interactions, uh, drug diagnoses and drug allergy alerts. You can have systemic alerts that can tell you, hey, you've already ordered an echo a week ago. Are you sure you want to get a second one? Um, or there's a better option. You can just look at the ejection fraction. So these systemic alerts can help limit duplicate procedures and, and uh, testing. And then the more ideal ones are these conditional alerts. So um, they can give you best practice uh, advisories. So you have a patient that um, is getting prescribed an opiate on discharge and um, a clinical, a best practice advisory can then um, launch to tell you 
you should uh, give a Narcan prescription as well with the patient. So the conditional alerts are all coming. And then there are suggestions for um, possible diagnoses that can come through. So just to show you a few of these, this is a info button that you can click on to get uh, information about hematocrit and what the testing is and what the clinical significance might be. This is an example of a calculator uh, looking at the Framingham risk score uh, that you can enter in appropriate information and, and get their 10-year uh, cardiovascular risk. This is an order set, and these are getting smarter and smarter uh, as we uh, as the uh, systems advance. And so now we can use these order sets to, uh, if somebody has a penicillin allergy, we can then hide things that might cause uh, an anaphylactic reaction if that's the reaction the patient has um, to help prevent uh, uh, use of things that might not be accurate. Or we can, um, if we have a diagnosis of uh, community-acquired pneumonia, we can then um, show those antibiotics and the preferred antibiotics based off of the antibiogram in our hospital. And so these are uh, becoming smarter and smarter for use. And then there's our alerts that, again, I'm sorry for the clinicians in the audience that probably are already trying to close this alert, uh, but this is um, one that popped up as uh, to notify somebody that there's an acute kidney injury so based off of a uh, creatinine a few days ago of two and then now being uh, four, um, do you want to order an order set to look into this acute kidney injury? Um, and do you want to add it to a pro your problem list? So when you're making these changes and providing clinical decision support, um, it's good to know kind of what works best uh, and how, what makes physicians uh, use things as opposed to just become you know, annoyed by things. And so a few system reviews and meta-analyses found some key factors. So it's best to make it part of the workflow. Um, so I don't have to click elsewhere uh, into a different portion of the uh, EHR or somewhere else to um, get that clinical decision support. It's better when it's automated rather than making a user activate it. Uh, and it occurs when the decision's being made. So it doesn't launch right when you open the chart, but maybe it launches when you're at the order entry site uh, so that uh, when you're truly making those decisions, then it can um, be activated. It's usually better when it's a recommendation um, and not an assessment. It's better when it promotes action over inaction, um, although at times inaction can be appropriate, but uh, promoting action is more likely to um, uh, be taken on by physicians. Um, did not require any additional data entry. So um, as a user, I would not want to ever add any additional information uh, when I am entering orders. And it's key to have uh, local people on the ground that are actually doing this day-to-day -day be a part of any intervention that's uh, created um, just because uh, it'll be more likely to be accepted and um, you'll probably get a better intervention there. So I'll talk about a little bit of uh, ways that we've put this into practice. And so um, we had issues with uh, insulin pens and pen needles at Emory. We were giving uh, insulin pen prescriptions that weren't covered by their insurance. And then when we were giving the uh, insulin pens, uh, people were forgetting to give a corresponding pen needle order. So we were getting extra calls from the pharmacist when it was our pharmacy. Uh, they would call us and ask for um, the additional pen needle order or to change the prescription. But it, when, they were, when it was other pharmacies, then oftentimes patients would uh, get delayed um, prescriptions and maybe we don't hear about the issue with the insurance for a day or two or we uh, forget a pen needle. And we actually had a patient who tried to inject themselves with their insulin pen, but uh, didn't have the needles. And so ended up going into DKA. And so we thought this was a real problem. And you know, part of that was the education about um, the pen needles, but this was uh, uh, something we thought we could fix. Pharmacy was, you know, it's not allowed to automatically substitute or add without a phone call. And so initially a, a discharge order set was created um, to include pen needles and other supplies. Um, the order set, uh, instead of having Lantis Solo Star, um, so brand name insulin uh, pen um, in the discharge order, we made them generic uh, and substitutable. So even if I sent a prescription for um, the Solo Star pen, it could then be swapped out for a different pen based off of the uh, insurance coverage that was there. At the time, a lot of the insurances were uh, switching over to a different type of insulin, and we were getting a lot of calls and a lot of issues, and uh, this allowed it to um, have that substitution without issue. 
this still didn't totally solve our uh, pen needle problem. We were still getting folks sent out without it. Um, we tried to have it just automatically add. Uh, so I, anytime a prescription pen was uh, added, it would just automatically put it in. But unfortunately at that time, um, the uh, CPOE didn't account for, wasn't able to account for that. So we ended up doing a best practice alert. That was not terribly invasive, but um, we did end up doing that uh, anytime a uh, pen was prescribed without a pen. So even for this simple intervention, we had to have a lot of people involved. Um, so we had hospitalists, we had our outpatient retail pharmacists, our inpatient clinical pharmacists, endocrinologists, diabetes educators. We had patients that served as patient advocates, um, an IT specialists, and a quality data analysts. And so uh, we couldn't capture uh, the number of phone calls decreasing or the number of uh, delays for uh, insurance issues. We were able to capture the pen needle orders. Um, and so the, these were the four main um, folks prescribing pens and pen needles, and uh, we were able to push folks to prescribe it. Eventually, you know, there's still the hope that it can just be automated so that we can get to 100% without any uh, brain power or clinical thinking uh, going into it for something that's that simple. But um, this is one way that we help trying to improve uh, our outcomes for patient care. We had an issue with our correctional insulin dosing there as well. And so this was the order that was used for uh, corrective insulin, for sliding scale insulin at the hospital. So it took um, uh, the blood glucose that was drawn on the patient, um, then subtracting 100 and divide by 40 to get the number of units that had to be given for a blood glucose greater than 140. So already we're looking in, and we can see there's a lot of math involved for the nurses to, to carry out. It doesn't take into account you know, how sensitive a patient is uh, to insulin. And so overall, this was a poorly, uh, individ poorly written individual order. And for people who don't like doing math, especially when they're married and uh, have to run around, so our nurses would have to carry around a calculator with them um, or use the calculator that was built into the EHR to uh, get the appropriate dosing. And they didn't know which way to round, uh, whether to round up, round down. And so there was one hospital in the Emory system when I was working here that used uh, table-based orders. So they made all of these calculations and likely that's what is used at Northwestern. Um, but they compared table-based orders to this formula-based order. And so we found that our formula-based order was doing pretty poorly. The nurses were not administering what was truly ordered. Luckily, they were underdosing more often than they were overdosing, but only 68% of the time were they getting what was truly ordered um, by the system. And comparing that to the table-based order, 92% of the time they were getting what was supposed to be ordered. So we went through and changed the pre-written table, changed them to pre-written tables and um, scheduled them to be standard, sensitive, uh, or resistant so that people had some guidance as to how to choose. And then we mentioned kidney function and patient weight and the total daily insulin needs to help people pick, should I choose standard, sensitive, or resistant? And we also gave guidance as to when to move beyond sliding scale alone, given the, the guidelines of um, what is uh, recommended by the uh, American Diabetes Association and elsewhere. Um, and so we put that guidance into the order set and included basal and uh, bolus insulin um, in there as well. And so we were relatively successful in terms of improving the uh, correctional dosing. So the two hospitals that were performing uh, kind of poorly and not having having the nurses often using their calculators and delaying getting insulin to folks uh, end up improving their um, accuracy here. Again, a lot of people had to be involved just because even for the small change, um, because we were changing a high risk medication like insulin in the hospital. Um, so we had to go through our PNT committees, our nutrition committees, and uh, our quality boards to get um, this change done in the IT system. There were some, you know, now here over the University of Chicago, where there's a slightly smaller intervention that we're working on that uh, uh, Dr. Martinez uh, here is leading. And so she investigated the uh, appropriate use of physical therapy consultation. So she, using the activity measure of post-acute care inpatient mobility short form, this is a form of six questions that asks, um, can you um, put on and take off your clothes on your upper body, your lower body? Do you need help with bathing? Do you need help with toileting? Uh, can you brush your teeth and eating meals? So it takes those six questions and you get a score. And the score can help influence whether um, physical therapy is beneficial and whether rehab might be needed. 
this is actually being done already every shift by our nursing staff. And so they looked at it and they found that 38% of physical therapy consults were overutilized. So uh, after just our gestalt of the patient, when we first admit them, we might've been ordering unnecessarily. But there were also significant delays for folks that had poor mobility or when decreases in mobility happened later on in the hospitalization or somebody that was in the hospital for some time, um, maybe it wasn't captured uh, because of that um, change, that clinical change. And so um, those low mobility delayed placement uh, because we didn't know right away that uh, patients needed it. And our physicians were totally unaware that this assessment was being done. I personally was unaware that this assessment was being done uh, every day, three level and three times a day by our nursing staff. And so Dr. Martinez and Dr. Sarazel um, ended up integrating it into the notes. So we have templated notes in hospital medicine uh, to kind of guide us on some of the, our uh, key elements. And so they put the Ampex score right in front of us and then provided us with that clinical guidance um, right next to it as to whether we should order PT or OT and whether it's indicated. Um, and then, you know, we could always move beyond it. This updates with every progress note. Right now it's only documentation, but the hope is that it then gets directed, connected directly to order entry to help lessen the extra step that's needed there. Luckily this was an internal one, so it didn't have to involve entire hospitals to change. So something that was just done internally to um, help us uh, with our physical therapy utilization and now uh, broadening out to our residents and our general medicine teams. So one of the more complicated uh, interventions that, that's been done uh, so again, some colleagues of ours looked at um, a calculation to help us predict cardiac arrest in the hospital. They took an uh, innumerable number of variables here uh, to see, do they influence whether a patient is likely to have a cardiac arrest or not? And so looking at all these variables and how they're weighted, you know, that, almost impossible for a, a unique clinician to look at this and uh, look at each one of these individual values and say, yeah, I think my patient might, might uh, have a cardiac arrest in the next uh, um, eight hours. They were able to bear, you know, validate this, uh, this data um, and compare it to the modified early warning system. Uh, but given these, this complicated uh, number of variables, it was hard to integrate into clinical practice. Luckily, we were able to use um, a program called Agile MD um, to take all of these variables and time uh, to give us, are, is a patient likely to, to, to decompensate in the next eight hours? So it takes in all these variables. And if you look at my patient here uh, on the 21st of uh, September at 8.34 PM, he had a one in 74 chance of uh, deterioration in the next eight hours, which put him in this red category and someone to pay higher, uh, higher, higher amounts of attention to. It then highlights, you know, which of the variables uh, are influencing uh, the patient the most. And for this patient, um, it was his uh, oxygen saturation. And so, you know, this actually did uh, push me a little bit to um, think how I could help him in this situation. And so I ended up giving him an extra dose of diuresis uh, that day. And it gets integrated right into our patient list. So uh, this is a, a list of patients, on, not necessarily my patients, just sorted by um, that ECART risk. And I can see who's the most sick and who's not um, when I'm looking at this. And it's not perfect. You know, sometimes we have um, some patients that we know are more stable than others and have a higher risk of deterioration that this isn't perfect for, but it does give us some guidance and some uh, objective, objective data towards uh, uh, pushing us to think. The other thing it does is it helps trigger our rapid response team uh, to get involved. And so there's another set of eyes that get seen by the, any patient that goes into the red um, a group of nurses and the rapid response team that looks through and um, they can also see us where those harried physicians getting our uh, espresso uh, IVs on the floor um, if we miss something and, and can help guide us. One thing we're hoping to do, um, as you can see that next column over, we're not great about having our code status order entry uh, there, which is, um, is something that you know, we're pretty passionate about improving. Um, so we're hoping we can use these e-card scores to help influence uh, that order. So the last thing I wanted to talk about um, that we're using pretty extensively is something called clinical pathways. Um, so these are structured multidisciplinary plans of care that translate um, our evidence base into uh, the structures that are there. 
they provide details about the algorithm that goes in and, and criteria that you can go through. So every step um, that can go into a clinical decision uh, and what, what to do about it. And we're hoping to use this to aim uh, to standardize care for a specific clinical problem in a, in a specific population. Um, but that's a lot of words, so a diagram might be more helpful. So this is one of our pathways for um, inpatient febrile neutropenia. I've scrolled down past kind of the initial workup portion of it uh, to what some of the branching logic for choosing antibiotics. And so it has this uh, info button there to say, you know, when you can click on that to get a lot more details as to um, when you should uh, um, initiate therapy. And then I can order directly from it. Um, I can see whether there is a severe beta-lactam allergy in this patient just by hovering over that portion. I can then uh, order cefepime directly from this, um, or I can order my estriinam and uh, vancomycin orders if somebody has a beta-lactam allergy. And then I can go to the area where uh, should I order vancomycin in addition, and it gives me some criteria for that. So these pathways, you know, help us ensure that the latest clinical research and guidelines um, uh, inform our care teams. We use, these were how we uh, kept a source of truth for uh, COVID during all of the uh, clinical changes that were happening. And so we uh, have these roadmaps that um, patients could follow as to um, when to give certain interventions and additional interventions that people could try, especially as things were changing so quickly and, and people could stay on top of um, this one source of truth. And we had our COVID leadership uh, involved uh, clinicians, quality improvement performance, clinical informatics, and IT. And so this was our, um, just another example of one of these pathways that has the disclaimers on the side. Um, it has uh, when things were most recently updated, you can place orders and you can page directly from it, um, as well as getting the additional information for about things. So this is how we uh, combated this um, uh, so this, this information overload uh, that was being occurring and help keep it all updated as to everything that was happening so that our clinicians could focus on their safety, on the patient safety and, and providing the best care and human care that we possibly that we could. Thank you all so much. Uh, I'm happy to uh, take questions um, about anything I presented here. Thank you, Ethan. I think I can speak for the audience. The audience. Exciting uh, presentation and um, uh, lots of really good information um, that, that has led to a few questions already in the Q&A uh, section, which I'll, I'll help facilitate. Um, if, if others have questions, please uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A uh, box there at the bottom of the, of the screen. Um, I have. I want to start with one question that just uh, you, you talked a bit about uh, the types of strategies that are helpful um, for um, successfully getting physicians and teams to use uh, clinical decision support tools, like putting it in the workflow and involving stakeholders in the design and and uh, at, you know put positioning it at the time decisions are made. Um, there's a lot of strategies that uh, administration or improvement teams might use in order to accomplish those goals. Um, a lot of different, you know, approaches like, uh, you know, standing meetings or certain numbers of trainings or ways to provide, um, you, you know, to sort of audit uh, implementation and provide feedback to providers and reinforce uh, their, their behaviors, things like that. I, I'm wondering what sort of um, strategies your team is using. And, um, you know, broadly, we've gotten increasingly interested in implementation science or the science of sort of understanding these strategies so that we can make these, um, uh, these types of attempts to implement uh, things like decision support m more sustainably and more routinely and others can replicate it. So I'm just curious if you're, are you using any specific approaches that you found particularly helpful for those goals? Yeah, and, and I think some of the additional, you know, support that we end up using every time we roll out one of these interventions does kind of depend on the complexity of the intervention themselves. Um, and so for um, big changes, um, to the system, you know, oftentimes we do have uh, an education plan that we do plan out before um, unveiling any big rollouts. And so um, having clinical teams uh, and um, 
every team that's there, making sure that we have the plan to um, go to the uh, users themselves, uh, whether it's myself talking to the residents and to the hospitalists, um, or uh, some, and if there's a surgical team that's involved, making sure that um, we get in front of the teams that are um, most used. But we do use those in-person uh, education uh, elements um, to uh, uh, assure that we're um, getting in front of folks uh, for major changes to, uh, to things. Um, we do sometimes utilize the uh, uh, um, continuing education component where a, a module is made. Um, those are not quite as successful just because people end up trying to click through and can't always ask the questions um, uh, that are needed for bigger changes, but for smaller changes oftentimes um, using one of those modules or um, even just a uh, standard email, a system-wide email um, going out for what the, um, uh, what the change ends up being. You know, when with a lot of the changes, um, when they're smaller, we're trying to make them so that they're so intuitive that you don't necessarily have to do a big portion of uh, extra training. Um, so for uh, specifically for like remdesivir use in, in the hospital, um, we are, have tried to build in uh, the indications into the order itself um, so that you know uh, as I'm ordering um, uh, is my patient on uh, oxygen now or not um, is there symptomatology within you know seven days of, um, of onset and, and when the best use is and so trying to make it as simple as possible where somebody might if they missed the education event if they missed weren't able to do the training and still can be um, absorbed, that's been working the best uh, out of all of that, um, is having it kind of right there when the uh, order is being placed. There, there are two questions that I think relate in, 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 at some level. Uh, it has to do with, I think the broader theme is that, as you pointed out earlier, there's such an explosion of information and such an uh, evolution of, of uh, knowledge to, on, on uh, diagnostic and therapeutic, um, uh, you know, sort of options for the, for the physician. And, you know, as, as these areas are being developed um, at the physician level, uh, you know, has the potential that if we're creating decision support tools for all of those things, it's just a fireworks display of different pop-ups. And how do you manage this and orchestrate that so that it doesn't become overly burdensome? And then the second is just from a system perspective in building those tools, it also creates a cue for the technology people that program all of that. And how does that get prioritized? And how do you sort of not, um, you know, get such a backlog that you can't even keep up with the need for the development of these tools, uh, you know, from a technological perspective? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, obviously alert fatigue is something that uh, everyone is pretty concerned about. Um, in every intervention that we make, we're trying to say, uh, are we helping the provider or annoying the provider uh, as opposed to um, uh, truly having somebody absorb what's there. So there are um, the uh, information technology teams that uh, help kind of guide this. Um, for any time an alert is kind of recommended, it is uh, saying, well, we only have, we're only allowed a certain number of alerts uh, for this patient. So for this patient that's discharging, um, we have the um, best practice alert for Narcan at, this, at, per, at prescribing. We have this um, best practice alert for can should we preside, uh, use this uh, insulin order set uh, at discharge. And so um, anytime a new alert is uh, presented, uh, the question is always asked, should we remove something else? And so to try and limit, and limit that overwhelming uh, uh, component of uh, alerts and, and trying to prevent alert fatigue. So that's something that's high on the minds of um, uh, the information technologists. And absolutely right that uh, things have to get prioritized uh, based off the thing. And obviously, when COVID hit, uh, everything COVID related got prioritized. But when there are smaller interventions like this, sometimes, you know, you can do try and think of something simple that uh, doesn't get uh, prioritized right away because you do have that limited supply. Um, one way that we found to work around that um, is uh, we use Epic uh, at our hospital and uh, Epic has a physician builder program. And so um, a lot of the physicians in, the, in both our department as well as um, uh, other departments have gone to these three-day trainings 
uh, uh, now they're virtual. Otherwise, you get to make a nice trip up to Verona, uh, Wisconsin, uh, which is uh, not doesn't have a ton going on there, but it's pretty. Um, but you can get this extra training that's there. And then um, as a physician coming back to the wards and saying, I am constantly annoyed by this factor in the EHR. I wish there was an order set for this. Um, you can then propose it and they'll okay it for the, uh, you as a physician to then uh, build it out. So um, while uh, they're kind of implementing and putting power into the hands of the providers on the, on the ground uh, to help um, prioritize things and things like alerts and best practice uh, alerts that, that can um, really uh, affect um, how patients, how providers uh, provide that care. Um, those go through a much more rigorous process uh, as to um, whether to implement or not, but for more simple things like our um, templated notes or our uh, order sets for certain things, those are much simpler process than then can be put into the hands of providers so that they don't have to be, um, they can be implemented more quickly. Sorry, another rookie mistake. I'll mute again. Um, Ethan, we have one more question, um, and maybe I'll let you just, uh, with a two minutes left, uh, answer it quickly while we sort of close. You can add any closing remarks. Um, and, uh, before I ask the question, I want to thank you again for uh, presenting to our IFAM uh, webinar today. We've really enjoyed having you, and, and thank you for uh, giving us the, this time, uh, which we know is precious. And um, you know, our final question as you close out re just relates to the challenges of fundamentally teaching clinicians to do, to behave differently and, and to practice really uh, precision medicine or, or uh, very specific patient-centered care that's based on, you know, the best evidence. So the, the training aspect and, and, and what are the biggest challenges of, of actually getting physicians to use this and, and to behave differently in the practice? Yeah, so it's it's interesting. So with with COVID, um, those agile MD pathways that I mentioned, uh, where we were um, trying to show, uh, we were give, kind of laying out all of the ways to um, apply care. They were utilized um, aggressively during the first few months uh, of uh, the pandemic, and then every time there's been a wave, they pick up um, in terms of their use for as patient as people that maybe haven't seen it for a while are reminding themselves. Um, but when people are seeing it every day, um, the uh, updates, um, when we are updating something based off of new evidence, um, when people get kind of in their routine and kind of know um, this is what I do for every patient that walks in with this, they don't um, jump in and kind of look at the new evidence or any updates that are there. And so um, anytime there is a reminder that there have, there does often have to be that other intervention like a um, uh, email or um, education session uh, to kind of say, hey, there are some big things that have changed uh, and these are the updates. And um, that's probably one of the biggest challenges uh, that we still have is making sure the updates are getting in front of folks at the right time. Well, thank you again, Ethan. We really appreciate uh, you joining us today. And on behalf of the uh, membership of IFAM, um, have a happy Thursday and, uh, and thank you for giving us your time. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.